Good. All right, so I'm excited to be here, and I'm one of those like interactive type presenters. And I believe that any time I'm speaking, I have a new test audience, and I need to find out if my statistics are accurate. So I will be asking you questions and inviting you to participate today in this uh, presentation. To introduce the subject, I have a video that I'm going to show you. And I think it really sets the foundation of where we're going to go and the journey that we're going to take today. Now, usually I'm speaking, and I have an audience of parents and teenagers, and I take turns picking on both. Well, today I get to pick on adults, and I'm actually going to show you why your brain has changed due to electronics. And I'm going to take you through a journey today, and you're going to see how it has changed, but I'm going to show you this video first to start with. When you were a kid, what did you do for fun? So we'd go blueberry picking, for instance. Uh, just, that's so cute. <laughs> True. We grew watermelons, um, plantains. I found an old sign which was big enough for me to sit on and made a great toboggan. It was very slick, very fast. <laughs> I had a few fish in my basket and I looked up on this bluff and here's this black bear sitting there watching me. If he starts chasing me, I'm going to keep throwing the fish out of my basket until he's gorged and he won't, and he won't bother me. And what did you like to do for fun? You know, you go door to door, get a group of kids, and you play uh, lots of games, uh, hide and seek, just going out to the field and playing baseball. And we build these massive forts, you know, the kind that you can actually sit in and, and, and play in, you know, with, with our friends, and it was just really wonderful. So what do you like to do for fun? Video games. Definitely. I like to go on my phone. Text. Some email. email. My favorite thing to do in the world is definitely watching videos and playing video games. Those take up so much of my time. Three hours, or t three to four hours a day. Same. Five hours straight. Just last week, I watched 23 episodes of a TV series in less than four days. I forget. I'm in a house, I have parents, I have a sister, I have a dog, I... Just think I'm in the video game, I completely get lost. I would die if I don't have my tablet. Whenever I feel upset, I'd play video games and I'd feel normal. It's really wonderful. So I think that is a good introduction to the world of electronics that we live in. And if you look at, that's three generations. That is grandparents, parents, and then the grandkids or the children. And look at the difference in the modalities of how they spend their time. The older generation we would reference as what we call the neurological transmitter oxytocin generation. And the young people today we would reference and refer to as the dopamine generation. As a matter of fact, this generation that we have today is the first generation of adults entering into the workforce who have been with a smartphone from the time that they were born, okay? So what I'm going to cover today and talk about to help you understand why this electronic world changes our kids' brains and why these electronics open the doorway for the propensity to view pornography, um, I'm going to take you through a neurological presentation. And one thing I love about this is when we get into the neurological process, we eliminate shame. And we begin to understand that we actually alter the human brain and as we're trying to help people change addictive tendencies and addictive behaviors it's not just always a choice it's actually a neurological change to the brain and we now have evidence-based research to show that the young people's brains today are different than the brains of the generations before them so i'm going to take you through a journey talking about brain development i'm going to explain three neurotransmitters dopamine oxytocin and serotonin and at the end of my presentation, this is the question that I'm hoping all of us are going to be able to answer is, do electronics create a impact that opens the door to pornography viewing? And so when you leave today, you're going to be able to answer that question at the end of my presentation. But the first thing I want to know is, is your brain impacted? Now, I don't know if any of you, have, has anyone in the audience today been at one of my lectures before? Okay, so you can't give away my answers. <laughs> All right, so we're going to take a little journey today just to see if you can tell how electronics have neurologically changed your brain. So I'm going to ask you some questions. 
Let's take a test. So here's my first question. Raise of hand. How many of you in the last 30 days have memorized a phone number? Look around. How many hands went up? In truth, if I was to ask you to tell me your grandmother's phone number, could you? And if I ask you to tell me your daughter's cell phone number, how many of you would go to your device and, and look? I would. I can tell you my great-grandmother's phone number today, and I can also tell you what time I could call her and she'd be home because it was 11 o'clock every day and her soap opera, I think, was young and the restless, okay? And she, and she didn't have a cell phone, so if I wanted to reach my great-grandmother, I knew when I could call her, okay? That's neurological change. We used to memorize. We didn't have an electronic device when somebody gave us a phone number and we just stuck it and forgot it. We used to memorize it, okay? So think about that just for you. When's the last time you memorized a poem? Anybody in the last 30 days, 30 days memorize a poem? Raise your hand. Did I get any hands? I've got one, two. Memorization creates positive, appropriate neurological growth. We used to do that. We don't anymore because now, and be honest, how many of you have looked something up on the internet, got the information, and three days later looked it up again because you couldn't remember what you got? Okay? That's neurological change. We're neurologically changing the human brain. We do not retain information like we used to. We don't create neurological growth like we used to, even as adults. Let me give you one more test. How many of you have had this wonderful opportunity in the last, I'll give you 60 days, I'm going to give you a little bit of a leeway, that you've taken that old-fashioned atlas or fold-up map and you've plotted a destination of where you were going. How many have done that in the last 60 days? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, how many of you have used some form of an electronic device to ask it to take you somewhere? Raise your hand. And how many of you have gotten in the wrong place when it took you there? Okay. We did fascinating research. We gave people an electronic device, and we plugged in the address we wanted it to take them to, and they headed to that address, and they got to their destination. Then we took the electronic device away, and we asked them to get back to where they started. We had one driver make it back to the destination. Because when we're paying attention to an electronic device to take us somewhere, we don't do spatial recognition. We don't pay attention to landmarks. So when they got there, they couldn't remember which street and which building and how to get back. Okay? Fascinating research. We, um, did, we put taxi drivers from London in an fMRI machine. Now, to be a taxi driver in London, you have to memorize the whole map of London. And when we put them in the fMRI, fMRI machines, the part of their brain that did spatial recognition was microscopically larger. So we proved that they were growing their brain in those areas. You know, we used to believe that neuroplasticity wasn't really possible and then when your brain had fully developed, your brain stopped growing. That's not the case. We now know that your brain, which is a muscle, can constantly be growing and developing if you choose to engage in the neurological activities that do that, okay? For Mel, the brain is fully developed by the age of about 26. For a female, the brain is fully developed about the age of 24. So you guys can decide who's smarter. I'm not going to tell you that. But that's the part of our brain, okay? So think about our young people today. Neurologically, their brain is not fully developed. All right, so here's my other test. How many of you in the last 30 days have learned a new tactile activity? Auto mechanics, play the violin, okay? Look around. Interesting enough, we did the same thing. We put um, individuals who read Braille in an fMRI machine, and we found the part of their brain that is the tactile connection into the brain was actually larger. The other thing we've been able to do is we've taken university students We've had those who take their notes on paper and those who type their notes, and guess who performed better in the examinations? The individuals who wrote their notes. That's a very, very important part of the neurological growth is the hand to the brain. 
All right. Now, people, I, t I gave this lecture in Park City, and a little boy, I, had to, I loved him because he had enough courage to come up and ask Dr. Kane this question. But he said, but I'm playing with an electronic pad, uh, uh, what are those called, controllers, so isn't that growing my brain? I'm like, well, the only research that says that there's any neurological growth due to electronic gaming or social media is the military, who claims that it increases reflex. And I said, so maybe your reflexes are better, but it's really not neurologically growing your brain. But I thought he had a lot of courage to come up and ask me that question, okay? So now you've been a great test subject. You can see just today by the questions that I ask in my audience that you've changed your brain. We're not doing the things that we used to do, okay? So just think about that from your aspect. Now think about our young people who've had electronics from the time they were born and the potential impact that those electronics have had on their brain. So let's talk about kids' brains next, okay? So here's what you need to understand. When the brain is developing, the cerebral cortex is the last part to develop, and that's the part that is finally developed when we are an adult, okay? Fully developed. Our young people exist in the part of the brain that's called the limbic system. Now, you may have heard this referenced as the fight and flight part of the brain, okay? This is our emotional center. This is where electronic devices and pornography play within the limbic system. And then the reptilian part of the brain, that's our brain stem. That's our automatic brain. That's why we breathe, that's why our heart works. And if the brain stem is damaged, usually life is over. So our young people process everything from the limbic system. Now parents, you've probably had this experience. I have three adult children. And I know, I, as such a wise parent, I asked this question when they did something. What were you thinking? And guess what response I got? I don't know. The reality is they don't reason, okay? The reality is they emotionally respond when something looks fun. Let me give you an example. If you take an adult standing on a bridge to dive in the water, the adult's brain begins to think, how far should I take this? And is there potential that I could break something when I break the surface of the water. And then we usually don't jump. Occasionally some of us would. A teenager's brain doesn't compute that way. A teenager stands on the bridge and says, ooh, cool, and then we're on a trip to the emergency room because they broke their leg, okay? They exist in this limbic system, and this is the world where the electronics are designed. And the sad thing or interesting thing is is that all of these app makers and everybody who creates games actually hires people like me, psychologists, to make them addictive because we know how the brain works. And, we, and unfortunately, there's many in my profession who are involved in that because that's the money maker, okay, is to make these devices addictive. So understand that as the teenage brain is developing, the gray matter of the brain is decreasing and becoming more dense and the white matter of the myelination into the cerebral cortex as you create connections is growing, okay? So that's the process of teenage brain growing. Now this is the limbic system. This is our safety center. This is where we emotionally feel. This is where we emotionally regulate and this is where our teenagers exist, right? All day long. So <clears throat> here's what you need to understand in this journey is that 92% of our young people have a smartphone, okay? 92% of our young people today have a smartphone. And in that, guess how many hours a day they're involved in that electronic world? Have any idea what the national average is? Eight, seven, nine, six and a half hours straight, 12 hours accumulative. Now, I used to have 12 hours on my slides, and I would have a few moms come up afterwards and say, Dr. Kane, there's no way my child is on their cell phone for 12 hours a day. I said, okay, I'm not going to use your kids as an example. Let me just use you. When you get up in the morning, what do you unplug? My cell phone. What's somewhere on your body all day long? My cell phone. What do you plug in when you go to bed? My cell phone. Okay, we're not going to talk about 12 hours a day, <laughs> okay? Our kids actually are in the electronic world about 12 hours a day, okay? And the reason that this use is complicated for them is because they change their screen time average 13 seconds. Every 13 seconds, they're changing screens. They're not sitting there for hours at a time reading a novel or reading a magazine. They're actually changing the screen every 13 seconds because every 13 seconds, they get an anticipatory hit in the neurological process of the brain and that's what they want to have happen, and that's how apps are designed 
to be is that you're constantly getting a new level up, a new text message, a new social media, a new picture in the anticipation of the brain. So by the time a 19-year-old today is 60, guess how many years of their life is spent in the electronic world? 20. 20 years of their life will be spent in this electronic world. Now, when cell phones and smartphones came into the picture, we didn't ask, could there be a side effect? We didn't ask if there was something dangerous potentially for our kids. And so we just handed it to them. And now we know. Now because we can do fMRI imaging, now because we can look at brain development, now we understand what's going on in our kids' brains because of their electronic usage. So today you need to ask yourself some fundamental questions. At what age should a young person be given a smartphone? How much access should they have to that world? Should they have unlimited access? Do you unplug as a family? Do you spend time when there are no electronic devices that are on? Interesting enough, I was just interviewed for a documentary that's covering the United States, Korea, and India. Korea and India are passing social media laws because of the disruption to the families. So they're getting ready to pass laws that kids under certain ages are not allowed to access social media, okay? France just outlawed all electronic devices in their schools because of the impact of what they're seeing. So just be aware as, as I'm talking, look at your families, go home and observe your media use. Are you unplugging your kids and plugging them into the family structure and away from the electronic world? According to the CDC, the Center for D Disease Control, this generation spends more time isolated alone on their phone than any other generation. And you've seen it. Watch a group of teenagers go out to dinner and sitting in a circle. They're texting, and guess who they're texting? Each other. Yeah, it's fascinating. The Center for Disease Control showed in the 1980s my generation, we went out four times a week with friends. Guess how many times a week this generation goes out and engages in activities? Less than one. And the Center Disease Control has done the same research since the 1950s, so it's very, very evidence-based. Did you have a question? Yes. Okay, I, I don't know that research, but I can tell you this, that we just saw a new research from the um, American Pediatrics Association that less than 5% of our young people get appropriate exercise. We have the most obese generation of our young people that we've ever had before. So I can tell you that. All right, so here's what you need to understand about the brain. There are three processes of neurological growth for the human brain. There's structural neurological growth, there's chemical neurotransmitters, and then there is the functional. I'm not going to cover functional tonight. That's your brainstem, brainstem tonight. Oh, I'm really awake. Today, this afternoon, sorry. So think about this. Every time you learn something new that's called long-term memory, permanent neurological growth, play the piano, speak a foreign language, you grow your brain and you create a long-term neurological connection. Every time you engage in a neurotransmitter, stimulation, short-term memory growth, you do not create long-term neurological growth. Every text message, every Snapchat, every picture, every Instagram, every Facebook post is a neurotransmitter stimulatory process that does not create long-term neurological growth. And now we have research that shows our young kids' brains are developmentally delayed. Not that they're not as smart, as intelligent, or bright, but they're creating long-term neuro neurological connections at a slower weight rate. Because instead of being the six-year-old driving a plow, they're a six-year-old playing a video game. And that completely changes the process of neurological growth in the human brain. It also puts them in a paradigm shift to seek more and more stimulating content. And I'm gonna explain why. Okay, so here's what you need to understand. When you're born, you are born with 100 billion neurons. They're like a ball of yarn that's been thrown on the floor 
and you have to teach them to connect. So when a baby learns to crawl, they create a neurological connection. When a baby learns to walk, it's neurological connection. Every time you create a long-term memory process or learn a physical long-term application, you create neurological growth. That's what we're supposed to do. That's how God designed our bodies to work. Now, when two neurons come together, they don't actually touch. There's very few that do. The neurons come together, and the space in between is called the synapse. And within the synapse is where our neurotransmitters play, our short-term memory processes. Okay? So, electronics are designed to create neurological short-term stimulation in that synapse. Okay? So, oops. So I'm going to show you, the best way to show the change in the stimulation for our kids today that's appropriate is I'm going to show you three videos. I'm going to show you a 1960 Sesame Street commercial, a 1980, and a 2010. The reason I do this is I want you to optically see how we've changed the stimulation in this electronic world. And think about this uh, commercial from the 1960s that the brain had to process versus the one that I'm going to show you in 2010. Okay? And I just want you to, to see the change. The, the problem is that our brain is very, very old. It is not developing as fast as electronics. It was never intended to go at the speed of the optical stimulation these electronics are creating. So just count the seconds of the frame changes between these three Sesame Street advertisements. So count the seconds on the 1960s. So how many seconds do you think that was? Now when I show that to young people, they think it's boring. Okay? They don't think that's exciting at all. Now look at the 1980s. And count the seconds for me. How many seconds do you think? 7.5, okay, very accurate, okay, 7.5, good. Now, now let's do this one, count the seconds. And our amazing little kid's brain is trying to process that. They're trying to run through that. Now, we may think, oh, we're not really looking at that, but the truth is the brain's spinning. The brain burns 90% of the energy you consume every day. So think about our little kids in this electronic world. Their brain is trying to spin to track that. And it can't. It wasn't designed to do that. How many seconds was that frame change, you think? Yeah, less than one, less than two. Okay. So that's, that's that optical stimulation. Now, I can't put a video game or a social media up there, but you get the idea of what's going on in our young people's brains today. Okay, so visual images are designed to be anticipatory. That's why pornography and social media and video gaming is so damaged, is because the way that they're designed is to be visually anticipatory. It's not the viewing that creates the stimulation to the brain. It's the anticipation of what they're going to get. That's why when we're dealing with any type of addiction in the brain, it is so dangerous because it's not so much what you got, it's what you anticipate you're going to get. So you level up, you go all day long looking at your social media or in pornography, you constantly look at the next picture because you're wanting what we call is a neurotransmitter, dopamine. Now dopamine is an anticipatory transmitter Dopamine is what goes into our brain when we anticipate we're going to receive something. Now, we're supposed to have dopamine. It is normal for us to have dopamine. Dopamine is not bad. But what you have to realize with our young people today is they put their brain in the anticipatory state of dopamine about seven hours a day every 13 seconds. Now, you've probably heard the terminology called brain fatigue. We also reference to our young people and even all our adults in the viewing world of hypersensitivity. We begin to create a craving process of hypersensitivity, desiring more and more stimulating 
content for the purpose of anticipation. And you never quite can feed that dragon. That's why this electronic world is so dangerous because we're always looking for the newest, most exciting, stimulatory viewing. That's why some of the strangest YouTube videos will get millions of views, which most of us would probably never even think to look at. But it's because it creates that anticipation of something that's graphic, visual, and I guess desirable, but I don't think so. But anyways, that's what's going on with this neurotransmitter, dopamine, okay? When we anticipate, we never get. We never finally get. We just constantly want, and that's what dopamine does. So if you like chocolate and someone's going to buy you your favorite chocolate, your brain sends dopamine into the synapse. If you have a friend coming to visit you, your brain sends dopamine into the synapse so that you get excited for that to happen. Now, you've probably experienced this when you finally got something you really wanted, and then afterwards you feel kind of like let down. Anybody have that happen? That's that dopamine cycle. The anticipation comes in to wake us up, and when it's over, it pulls back out of the synapse. It's called a crash and a craving that we deal with in the dopamine world. So every time you anticipate something, every time you view something, this is what's going on. The, in between the synapse, this neurotransmitter dopamine is playing. Okay, It's designed to. It just wasn't designed to do it 12 hours a day every 13 seconds for our kids. Okay, And that's what we're, our young people are doing to their brains. So when they're sitting in their room by themselves on these electronic devices, they maybe begin viewing YouTube or Facebook, but when it doesn't become anticipatory enough for them, then they're going to start looking for more and more graphic content to feed the dopamine cycle if we don't unplug them and have them seek different neurotransmitters. Okay, It's about balance for our young people. That's why 